The term emerging diseases is usually linked to dense tropical forests in distant lands. But diseases are also emerging in the most developed parts of the world. Some resulting from the bites of tiny ticks. I felt like I was spinning out of control, shaking. My brain felt like it was just shaking. I saw the rash, kept getting bigger. I was just perspiring like, like I was under a waterfall. In hysteria, I said to the woman, oh my god, I have Lyme disease. Ticks are second only to mosquitoes as vectors of human infectious diseases. For the last two decades or so, we have seen a general increase in the number of tick-associated diseases. In the United States, serious trouble with ticks began about 40 years ago in Lyme, Connecticut. Presently in South Central Connecticut, where there's an epidemic of Lyme disease. My name is Tony DiNicola, president of White Buffalo Incorporated. We're a nonprofit organization that specializes in wildlife research and management. And this site in particular has the highest recorded tick densities ever. Our focus today uh, is to capture some animals on site. Uh, and administer large cattle ear tags that'll help us identify those animals in the future and also serve as a means to estimate the local population. That's good. We're a little early. That's fine. We'll do some of the inner roads where they're starting to move, and maybe we'll get an opportunity. The only ticks I remember as a child were dog ticks, the large ticks that were often found in open grassy areas. Um, so they're much more visible and detectable. And never really heard of Lyme disease going up. There's two primary components to the zoonotic cycle with Lyme disease. You have the deer abundance issue that allows for ticks to reproduce, and you have small rodents that allow for the transmission of disease. Um, mice are probably easier to address with treatments on a local level, but on a landscape level, really the management of local deer populations is the only option. We've got one coming up on the left. We use these small projectiles, and we attach a small microtransmitter to the back. And that allows us to find the deer, even in the dark. Let's use this controller. Ready? The reason we're out here this evening is to try to get tags placed in uh, as many females' ears as possible. The, the greater percentage of your population um, that have ear tags, the more accurate your population estimate is. She's actually two and a half years old and hasn't bred. And then as soon as I reverse, Vicky will pull the mask off and we'll skedaddle out of here. In our infinite wisdom, we've created perfect deer habitat. We like lawns, we plant shrubbery, Many people say that we've displaced deer through development when, in fact, we've enhanced the habitat to a point where the populations have escalated. It affects everyone. It affects the ecology of the forest. It affects our ability to drive safely on the roads, and it's dramatically increased our risk of Lyme disease. All the data we have today show it to be very clear that tick abundance and deer abundance are closely tied together. That's surely not a coincidence. Off we go. Back to where we came. I'm Rick Ostfeld, senior scientist at the Cary Institute. I study the interactions between organisms in nature. So I just dragged this cloth for about 20 yards or so, and we came up with four ticks, four adult black-legged ticks. And I would say that's a fairly typical number for this particular type of habitat. Ticks really like nice, protected, shaded, moist, cooler conditions in which to seek a host or quest, I think the evidence that the risk of human exposure to Lyme or human incidence rates with Lyme disease are linked to deer is very weak. Reducing the number of deer more often than not 
fails to substantially reduce the number of ticks and the incidence of Lyme disease in the human population. We use the forest as a lab. You, you could think of a plot of the woods here as a test tube. We're walking through some tick habitat here. We're able to do experiments, vaccinate white-footed mice. So I only found one tick here at the tip of her ear. We know these ticks live in very complex environments. I mean, look around us. These white-footed mice that are probably the most abundant vertebrate in most of our forests here in the Northeast are a very high quality host for the immature stages in the tick life cycle, the larvae and the nymphs. So the more mice there are, the better the ticks do, and the more often they get infected um, with these tick-borne pathogens that cause disease in humans. And that's that. What we found is that when you have extensive undisturbed forest, the abundance of infected ticks tends to be fairly low. If you chop up the forest into little bits, then the abundance of infected ticks and therefore Lyme disease risk goes up. In fact, the more trashed, chopped up, fragmented the forest, the better the mice do, partly because their predators tend to disappear. Then what you always have left, you always get white-footed mice. The mouse is what we call the reservoir for Lyme disease. It's the source of the infection. Ticks get it from the mice. My name is Kirby Stafford, and I have been spending the last 28 years uh, examining a number of different ways to control the black-legged tick, which transmits causal agents for Lyme disease. We're part of the tick project. Oh. You might be able to see these tiny, tiny little ticks on the ears here. Now they're just trapping the mice and, you know, look at how many ticks are on them, take a blood sample so we can test them. We're in the third year of an integrated tick management program funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Oh, well, I'm glad to see somebody's on top of it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. This is the nymphal stage. This stage of the tick is what most people get Lyme disease from. I was trimming some of the bushes around a yard here, and my wife, about an hour later, said, what's that spot on your side? And I said, it's a tick. Removed it. A week later, uh, all the symptoms attacked me. I noticed a tick and was able to get it off, but then I noticed that the swelling increased. It's a little tick will crawl around, and you can't see it, and you can't feel it, so it could be anywhere. This disease is primarily a residential disease. We believe about three quarters of all the cases are acquired right in people's backyards. We see quite a bit of Lyme disease. It's become much more common, in particular 15 years that I've been here. My name is Dr. Paul Nee. I'm an infectious disease specialist here at uh, Danbury Hospital in the western part of Connecticut. And how are you feeling generally overall? Overall, I feel good, but I'm still awfully weak. After the tick bite, the uh, majority of patients may develop a skin rash. The rash can be a, the bullseye. After a few weeks, those patients may present with a facial palsy. Maybe a few weeks later, may have a heart condition, heart block. And then many months later, may develop a swollen, uh, painful joint. Patients may present with one of these symptoms or many of these symptoms. And I started out with a pain in the back of my neck, and it went right straight over my ear and down the side of my face. The first doctor I went to told me I had shingles. And they sent me here, and he came in and he says, you ain't got shingles. He says, you have Lyme disease. Now I can eat. Now you can eat, yep. Thank you. <laughs> We're in Lyme, Connecticut. This is where it all started back in the 70s. I'm Robin Curran, and I have Lyme disease. I've actually had it twice now, but it's affected my whole life. Pretty tough deal. It was the fight of my life. And I'm her sister. My name is Sue Balestrini. This is the dock that we used to hang out on when we were little. We played in the woods from sunup to sundown back then, and, and we're just pulling ticks off us. That's the tree swing that we used to 
swing off. And if you can see, it's really pretty wooded in there. We had no way of knowing or had no idea what these little things were going to do to us. I would say seven or eight family members have been affected by Lyme disease. Yeah. We were among the first kids to get it. I would lay in bed screaming as a child. I remember that. My legs hurt so bad. And I would just cry and cry and cry. And my mom would take me to the doctor, and they just kept saying, it's growing pains. And I got bit later in life, and that's when, I mean, really went downhill. It got to the point where, I mean, I couldn't even walk to the bathroom. I crawled. Now, I'm not a sedentary person, and to have to lay in bed for seven years of well, my you life. You were thin and active and physical. This is me scuba diving in Australia in the Great Barrier Reef, kayaking in Hawaii. It's my son and I skiing. <laughs> That's the mom he remembered, and all of a sudden, he sees this person laying in bed all the time. I don't know that I'll ever be the same, but I'm fighting and I'm getting there, right? <laughs> I'm getting there. From a clinical standpoint, I think some of the misconceptions of Lyme disease is that, you know, it's not treatable. Well, it is treatable. It's a bacterial infection. It's treated with antibiotics. And catching it early, obviously, like any disease, is the best. Uh, and there's no long-lasting immunity. You can get it again. So I've known people out of getting Lyme disease every summer is a normal ritual, almost. So mainly where the ticks on this property would be associated with the stone wall and the little forested area here along the edge. Our New England stone walls are essentially mouse hotels. A lot of our research has focused on a number of different approaches to manage or control the black-legged tick, uh, the application of pesticides, uh, exclusion of deer, treatment of deer, treating the mice with what we call host-targeted acaricides. This is the rodent bait box. This is the vaccine bait. So it's just a special formulated pellet, and the vaccine is actually coated on the outside of each one of these pellets. So by giving the mice the vaccine, if we can eliminate the infection in the mice, we should be able to reduce the prevalence of infection in the ticks around people's homes. Future scientists on our hands. <laughs> no. Nope. We just put the traps out yesterday. They stay out overnight, and we collect them today. That one's empty, too. We've generally been getting about a 20% capture rate for the mice. Uh-oh, this one feels promising. Oh, that's a fat guy. <laughs> that's a fat guy. a lot of peanut butter. Oh, hello. <laughs> Today, it seems like we're getting closer to about 50%. The more mice, the more data. Cool, huh? See the little ticks on there, guys? Maybe. Right? Maybe. Think you could see that it was on you? Hmm, maybe. I grew up in Alabama, and there are tons of ticks there, but they don't carry anything that you really have to be too worried about. Yeah, Woo, awesome. We have three boys, and they love nothing more than playing outside, so yeah. it's kind of unfortunate uh, that it's a fact of life here in New England. It's something we really wish we didn't have to think about, but it's something we've, we've got to pay good attention to. That's pretty much as high as I can go. <laughs> I'm pretty lucky that my kids are fair complected and light hair, so it's pretty easy to spot them. But uh, we've, we've missed a couple, and two of our three kids have actually um, contracted early stage Lyme, so we've been through the, the rounds of uh, a few weeks worth of antibiotics to take care of that. So, what happened when the tick bit you that time? Oh, he got a bullseye, and we had to get some special medicine. When it comes to actual tick control strategies, there's certain landscape things you can do. Uh, their swing set is actually out in the middle of the yard where your risk for Lyme disease is your absolute lowest. When you look at open lawns, that's not where the ticks are. They require high humidity, and that's really basically where their hosts are, the mice and the chipmunks and things like that. They're in those woodland edges. So that is your higher risk zone. We do some spraying, uh, like just using repellents on it. We'd rather not use too many uh, chemicals on the kids if we don't have to. Really, it's just at the end of the night, just doing really thorough checks. 
Every kid is pretty accustomed to getting a full body tick check after they've been outside. I, I do want my kids to be outside as much as possible, and there's always, you know, the fear that there's a tick we're gonna miss and there's gonna be some, you know, longer term effects that, that we're not sure about. These are red oak acorns. We're standing under a red oak tree that happens to be producing thousands and thousands of acorns this year. So the mice and chipmunks go around gathering these things and they store them all winter long. And so the summer after one of these great acorn years that we're seeing right now, the woods are just crawling with mice. So that's great for things like owls, foxes, if you like to eat mice. But it turns out it's also great for ticks. This is the larval tick. They would be extremely hard to see on a person. We're vaccinating them against Borrelia burgdorferi, um, which causes Lyme disease. If we can use the abundance of mice as a leading indicator, of Lyme disease risk a year in advance, then we can mobilize forces to try to reduce the tick abundance or to try to inform people about taking extra precautions to try to protect themselves. And I guess one other point is that even though we're not very good at controlling mouse populations, they're natural predators that are. And so if we can manage our landscapes around here to maintain a healthy guild of predators, that means foxes, owls, hawks, uh, weasels, creatures like that, then they'll do it for us. There seems little question now that that would help protect our health as a consequence of regulating mice.